saying hey And I know better than to listen to the people who are calling us names Well, good evening, everyone. My name's Brian, and today is Monday, September 11th, 2023, and this is another episode of Lots to Talk About. My guest tonight is blazing a path to affordable apartments. From a loss of a parent to having his business shut down, Mike rebounded and approached a business he didn't know from a whole new direction. Let's challenge the status quo and let's fix a problem. I'm excited to hear his story and what the future has to hold for his company, Norhart. I'd like to welcome two lots to talk about, Mike Kading. How are we doing, Mike? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Your uh, your profile came across on um, on Podmatch, and uh, man, I love I love the service because I I get to meet really interesting people and talk about interesting things and. Um, I was like, yeah, this is cool. This is cool. And then I started looking into your company and you're in, uh, you're in Forest Lake, Minnesota, right? Or yeah, I am. General area. We, um, a year ago, we just sold our farm in Onamia, Minnesota. Um, oh, lived 20 years. I lived 20 plus years in the area, anywhere from, uh, like the West suburbs of Minneapolis all the way up to Onamia. My wife grew up in the Minneapolis suburbs or right in the inner city, like um, Crystal area, Robbinsdale Crystal. So we're very familiar with the area. And I saw Forest Lake and I was like, OK, even better, even better. <laughs> I love it. You know, the area. That's amazing. Oh, for sure. For sure. I uh, I was a, a gas, uh, a gas station tech. I, fit, I worked on um, gas pumps. So I worked in that area all the time for all the quick trips. I'm sure I, uh, you probably saw me working on gas pumps if you were driving around in that area. So I love it. That's uh, hometown boy. I love that. <laughs> so Mike, tell me, um, kind of introduce yourself. I, I, I laid a little bit out of it uh, out there for uh, 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 in the intro, but let the audience know kind of who you are and then we'll kind of circle back and, and go to, back to the beginning and, and how you got to where you're at. Yeah, at a high level, I'm CEO of a company called Norhart. We design, build, and rent apartments, but we're focused on driving down the cost of housing. So if you look over the past 60 years, industries like manufacturing have improved substantially by 760%, or agriculture by 1,500%, but the world of construction has remained stagnant and flat. And so we want to change that. We want to change the way construction is done, drive down those costs by as much as 20 to 30 to even 50%. But imagine what that means. That means someday your rent or your mortgage payment could be half. And that's our dream is to solve America's housing affordability crisis. Okay. All right. I got gotcha. you. Are you so are you doing <laughs> um are you doing multi like multi-unit how is it are you doing um single family you, i mean what what style of construction are you talking about yeah at this point it's all just apartments and the reason that okay. is is if we can stay la laser focused on just one thing then we have a shot at really improving that one thing you would think okay. houses are pretty similar though why not be successful there but the reality is it's enough different it's hard to see the efficiencies you need to really drive down costs for sure. For sure. I'm excited to talk about this when we get to it, but I kind of want to, I want to hear your story on how you ended up the CEO of this, this company. Um, I mean, is it, has it been your dream? Was it your, were you a kid and thinking, man, I want to own a, a, a company that is trying to make housing more affordable. I mean, it's an no. ambitious goal for a child. <laughs> yeah. No, as a kid, that wasn't my dream. My, my dream has always been, to be to make some kind of meaningful, positive impact on the world. That has been my dream. How that would look, I didn't know. Right. And so the way I got started or got into this is that it was originally a family business. My parents started the business. In fact, we lost everything when I was young. In fact, so much so that my dad got kidnapped in Peru. It was extreme. And while growing up, though, my parents built it back up. They 
built small buildings and I was out there with my little kid hammer, picking up nails and swinging the hammer around. It was useless to them, but, but I was out there learning. And as time went on, I eventually went off to college. But in college, I wanted nothing to do with the family business. And the yeah, reason that, that that's what I was wondering. Like, there's a there's that's a that's a pretty strong theme that yeah. I I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, and that's and a lot of entrepreneurs have parents that are entrepreneurs, and it always seems to to resonate that like, man, I've been around it. I just wanted to go do something else, but what happened? Yeah, in fact, I went off to school for computer science, mathematics, management. I was very much in the tech scene. But the reality is, is I always knew I wanted to make a positive impact. And I didn't want to join the family business because I didn't want people to think it was given to me. I really had to wrestle with my own ego and stop caring so much about what other people thought and realize that if I really want to make the biggest positive impact in the world, why not take this small business at the time and use that as a starting point, right? Going from zero to one is quite hard. My parents did that. But then I could take it from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000. We're actually making a much more meaningful impact in the world. And so that's what eventually changed in my head is that I was, uh, I really wanted to make that impact and realize there was a chance to do that here. Now, it, it took me a year to get through that. In fact, I was... My dad really wanted me to join the business and I was out there with him working, but my heart wasn't in it. I was in other things at the time and uh, my dad knew. In fact, I was a probably a terrible employee that first year because I was so focused on other stuff. I didn't really want to be there, but eventually something switched in my mind and I got focused and that changed everything. Nice. Nice. Um, so, so that's interesting. So they built the company up building so they built from ground up apartments so they weren't no. buying apartments and so they started from scratch that's um that's pretty that's a pretty cool business to grow up around i mean i'm sure you experienced a lot of interesting things yeah it was uh quite unique uh great experience you know my dad my dad was a bit of an entrepreneur as well he actually in invented maybe a strong word but he built uh some of the first hybrid cars in existence and he wanted to bring those to market. That business ended up failing because the insurance costs were too high to make it viable for them at the time. And then my dad got into, uh, uh, he wanted to support people in Peru with, with these buses and bringing buses down to Peru. And that's kind of the story where he got ended up being kidnapped. And what he, he told me yeah, is at one point he kind of grew up and realized that he had to make some actual money. And so I don't know if real estate was ever his passion, but it was an area that he knew how to make money to be able to pay for a, a little Mike Kading growing up in his home. Nice, nice. So you you kind of flipped the switch and you started focusing on the business. You realized that there was that was a conduit to to changing the world, really. Mm -hmm. um, so did you kind of head right in that direction, or or how did that go? Yeah, so when I when joined with my dad, I wrestled a bit. In fact, I I joined my dad and uh, what he was doing, but I also joined like three other companies at the time. Uh, there was a company called Fruit Share that was bringing organic fruit right to your table. Another one was called Cuba Maze. It was this kind of cool marble toy, uh, a niche marble toy, and uh, worked on a few others like a Minneapolis, a Minnesota Film Festival, and. Clearly, I didn't. I didn't know what I wanted. I, I wanted to try everything. I wanted to explore the world around me, and um, it took about a year. But what I really realized is that I could make the biggest impact here in working with my dad. So my dad and I jumped in, and we went to town. We worked hard. Uh, we doubled the size of the company in the first couple of years working together, which was phenomenal. And then uh, it wasn't too far along in, and. Uh, Kind of the unexpected happened. He ended up passing away. I just, I just, um, I just kind of watched this happen with a with a, a acquaintance's family business mm. that he recently joined. Um, this story is very familiar, and I'm I'm curious. He's doing very well with it, and it, it appears you did too. Um, that adversities can si sometimes really really spur something in you did you did you kind of grab hold of it and go with it or was it was it um was it a rough a rough patch there for a while 
know what? Looking back, it was probably one of the biggest gifts that I could have gotten. And, and it's not, a, I mean, losing my dad is terrible, right? That's awful. And I never want to go through that. So that's really negative. But looking at things from a positive light, I, I try to do. And the gift in that moment was that I didn't really know what I was doing. In fact, uh, the day my um, kind of this all happened, I remember we had a um, uh, checks that were going out to our employees and they started, the bank called us and said, these checks are about to bounce. Like we've never had in, in all of my years of business, we've never had an employee check bounce or any check for that matter. And uh, my dad was sort of in charge of the finances and he um, called him up and it turned out he would moved money to the wrong account. He came back into the office to go ahead and kind of sign a check to move money back to the right account. And he didn't know how to fill out the check. And I was a bit baffled with what was going on. And eventually I sat down and I filled out the check for him and had him sign it. That night I went home with my mom and uh, him just to make sure everything was fine at home. And he was he was kind of kind of dazed during that time. And then the next morning, it was clear that something was wrong with him and uh, he could hardly stand. And it uh, turned out he had a stroke caused by a brain tumor. So he, he ended up living another six months, but for all intents and purposes, he was lost in that moment. We, we could never really communicate with him again. And so yeah. basically overnight I became CEO of this company and I, I didn't take the title for years because I didn't think I had earned it yet. Right. But, but the magic there was that I didn't know how this industry was really supposed to work. And so we could start questioning everything and trying new things in a way that others may not have tried simply because it's not the way things were supposed to be done. And that enabled right. some success. Nice. Nice. I mean, it, I hear you say that, um, that it was a gift and <laughs> I, I heard that last week, man. Like it, it's, uh, you're not alone in understanding that sometimes that can, can really be a, a rewarding situation, even though it, it hurts like hell and mm -hmm. it sucks. Um, you took the reins. I mean, you took the opportunity and coming into this, not knowing, I mean, you knew enough about construction. You knew enough about it um, to function. Uh, you've been around it your life. And then probably what, a year, um, a year ish before this one happened. Was it um, was it a hard transition after that when you took the reins? It was terrible. Um, the The big issue is that I didn't necessarily have confidence in myself, or I certainly cared what other people thought. And so, for example, we were going to the city council for approval on our next project, and I did, I, I struggled through that um, because I knew that the city looked at me as sort of a pipsqueak kid. Right, like, there's no way you can do this. Like, twenty. How old? How old were you at the time? I think twenty-five or so. And here I am building a, I don't know, ten million dollar project. It was, <laughs> I was way over my head in many ways. In fact, it got it was so bad that at some point the city stopped and shut our work down twice. Actually, and then the second time they shut it down, they brought me into their offices and said, "Mike, we don't have faith you can do this project correctly." It's like, oh my gosh, right? And they said I had to hire on professional real management. And so we uh, we did that. Well, we did that. We tried and we, uh, we found someone in a matter of just three days because if I didn't, my crew would be laid off and I didn't want that. But finding a manager in three days is the worst thing you can do. It was, <laughs> it was a disaster. He became just a figurehead. But what was powerful about that was the city was willing to back off a little bit because they were being very nitpicky with us simply because I'm a kid running a $10 million project. Um, where he came in, they gave him the sense of uh, credibility that we needed. But behind the scenes, it was me and a few others that were doing all the work, putting it together, and handing it to that guy to sign off and send off to the city. And I remember uh, that was a really kind of awful, awful months. And toward the end of that project, we had a water main thousands of feet long, buried 15 feet in the ground. And there was a pinhole leak somewhere in that pipe. We didn't know where it was. Uh, 
It was awful. Getting out there in the mud, digging for weeks on end, looking for this pinhole leak. We could see it in the pressure test, but we didn't know where it was. And uh, eventually found it. We got past that. And then about a week before we're supposed to open, the city uh, staff came out and said, there's no way. There's no way. You guys aren't opening this building. (laughs) And we had families moving in in just a week. Like They would have been out on the street unless we could figure something out. Uh, We ended up bringing the whole crew together, working around the clock through the night. And I remember the very last day, uh, the city inspectors came out. It was a half-day inspection, about a half a dozen inspectors. They looked at every nook and cranny of that building. And at the end, I remember the head building official bringing me aside in the basement and saying, Mike, I know we were hard on you, but looking at this project now, this is the nicest project that we've done in this city. It's like, finally, like this is the moment where I finally started to have some confidence that we could do what we said we were going to do and that people believed in what we were doing as well. Right. But it was, it was, it was years to get into that point. Right. Yeah. That's, um, you, you were talking about inspectors and, and figureheads and, in the being in the gas station industry, we also did new store builds or remodels mm. and stuff like that. So we dealt with in that industry tons of different departments and inspectors, and and you could tell you could tell the the project managers that um, had been around and knew how to talk to them, and like it, it's definitely an acquired skill. And as just a tech on site doing tech work and stuff like that, you would just observe things and uh yeah i i definitely they they put you through your paces and you were probably probably able to just do a good job from there out exactly yeah we just we focused on doing the right thing but you're right we didn't necessarily know the lingo we didn't have the relationships there was a sort of a lack of trust with my dad passing away um and so we just, we had to earn it and they were going to give it to us. They weren't going to give us an inch. We had to earn every inch we got, but that was good. It made me a better person having gone through that. So, so at this point you you finished this project and, and you could just, you could have probably just ran what you had. Mm-hmm. I imagine at that point, it seems like it'd been built pretty much. Um, you continued to grow, but you wanted to do it different. Yeah, it is kind of interesting. At any point in the last five, seven years, I, you know, I could basically retire, right? There's, there's no, I'm not in this for the money. I'm really in it to try to make that impact, right? I can care less if our my net worth changes substantially, uh, but I want, I want to solve, solve something meaningful for humanity. And so, yeah, we, uh, we ended up finishing up that project, and then we started. And you know, we started a number of new projects after that. And we really started thinking about how we solve construction costs, right? Because the way it, my dad was always able to build relatively cheap, but the techniques that he used uh, decades ago were not the same techniques that would make us successful in the future, right? Him For him, it was a little bit of blood, sweat, and tears. A lot of sweat equity went into those projects. It was having his <laughs> kid work for him uh, for peanuts compared to what he could have hired our others for. And that was great. I respect that. But you can't do that at scale. You need totally different techniques, different ways of doing business. And that's what we started embarking on, trying to figure out what those other techniques would be to still maintain low cost, but do it at a much larger scale. It it worked when he did it, though. It did. That, that model doesn't work now. Um I, I just I I I see what you're you're saying. Um, times change, and it, it's fantastic that you didn't just keep beating beating a dead horse, trying to put up the same thing, um, struggling with the same costs. I saw a, a graphic the other day. It was um, it was comparing rent to wage. I think mm, uh, yes. over over like the last fifty years, um, and that can't sustain. And I look at it and I'm like, oh, that really sucks for the renters, but it, it also sucks for the landlords. Um, when rent's that high, when rent has to be that high, uh, nobody's, they're not full. I mean, people have to live somewhere, but they don't have to live somewhere if they can't afford it. 
Yeah, it's it's outrageous. I mean, any metric you look at, housing costs have gone way up much faster compared to incomes. And it's completely unsustainable. And it's not just uh, apartments, it's also just uh, houses as well. But you're right, landlords are stuck in a precarious position, especially in today's market, because interest rates have risen so much. That's partly why they were able to make the deals work well over the last decade. But now interest rates are so high, the cost of debt has gone way up. The proceeds have gone way down. And uh, like in, in Minnesota right now, we're seeing new multifamily or apartment starts. So the number of new projects starting, falling by 90%. 90 and so that's not going to solve this issue either because now the landlords can't afford it either. And we're not going to have a supply in a matter of a couple of years as we're starting to see um, this wave kind of come through. And so there are countries, there's places in the world that have solved this. Uh, Tokyo is one example of that. But um, but it's not working here in the United States and we want to work to solve that. Right, right. And uh, somebody in the audience here was saying, and you have to plan into your rent model when it's that high. You have to plan four to six months to evict someone at this point of no rent because you're paying to have an evict and they're not going to pay. Like, what's the, they're not going to pay you. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it, it's like a really uh, bad game right now to be in, it sounds like. But you've changed things and you're changing that model and trying to bring those costs down, which A, puts you in prime position if it, if it works if your costs are there and you can rent lower, I mean, that's a win across the board that in my eyes, I mean, why, why wouldn't you, um, mm -hmm. what are some of the things you looked at to kind of, to shift those costs? Yeah. So one of the first things we did was we brought all the different trades under one roof. So in the world of construction, typically you have a different company who is your, plumber, your different company that's an electrician, different company that's a general contractor coordinating everything, a different company that again owning and managing the property. There can be literally hundreds of companies coming together to work on one project and then they go away. That's not an efficient way to really improve or build a system because they're all coming together for one project and they're all calling it all at odds as well. Imagine for a moment if a construction company were to produce a car. You'd have a different company installing the windshield, a different company installing the wheel, and a different company installing the door. And then the door company, they would call you up and say, hey, I'm so sorry. I got delayed on another project. I won't be out there for two weeks. And when they did come out, they would be irate because they could only work on one project at a time or one car at a time. And so the world of manufacturing looks at us and says, we're nuts the way we do things. And us in construction, we say, well, that's the way it's always been done. Right? right? That's bad thinking. And so we brought all the work under one roof, but once we've done that, then we can start applying some very simple techniques that have worked elsewhere. For example, the assembly line. You know, if you think for a moment, you can't really take a building and drive it down a line. But what you can do is you can take the person and move them through the building. So imagine for a moment with the electricians in the first unit, Every five hours, they switch. So electricians go to the next unit, and then maybe the HVAC team follows them. And then electricians go to the next unit, HVAC follows, and then plumbers follow that. It's a chain that they go through the building. But just that one simple technique can take a building that might take 15 months to complete and drive it down to nine months. <laughs> and so there, there are literally like hundreds and thousands of little techniques like that that you can apply to start seeing improvements in efficiency. Well, yeah. Well, and you were talking, so when you were explaining the model of all the general contractor, I mean, I, it's the same, it's the same thing when they build a gas station yeah. um, and the, and all the vendors come in, I've seen, and we've, I've been on the other side of the quote process. Everybody's bidding up to everybody that comes in and every layer that comes in, the costs just get more. So not only are they all competing against each other for the lowest bid, but then it gets bid up and then it all comes to you in the end it's all in, it's all way higher than what it actually costs and i get i understand the whole thing i mean like i understand everybody has to make their money i'm not i'm not naive to that but you bringing it all together you can compensate both the worker and keep the cost down exactly yeah there's so many games that are played i've seen 
I've seen it before. Like an electrician will go through, run all of his wiring in, and then the plumber will come, but the wire is in the wrong spot. And so they like cut it out of the wall and they rip it out and just destroy the work because they just want to make a point that, hey, electrician, you shouldn't get in my way. It's it's awful. And then there's other games that subcontractors can play, things like bidding a, a low bid to get the work. And then they add on all these change orders after change the orders. fact. Change orders. <laughs> yeah. And then the change orders are not fairly priced. But it, it's, I don't know, it's, an, it's a nutty world. But yeah, if you can eliminate all of that, not only can you lower costs, but just like you mentioned, you can start paying employees more, right? So you're giving the money and the resources to the people that really have earned it rather than all this monkey business in the middle. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen... I've seen companies go that way too um, in the trades where when the when the employees end up buying the company and there's one less layer there, the comp the, the employees all benefit. Yeah. Um, every layer you can take out, it's it's the same in, in the in corporate world. You're you're do you're downsizing, you're downsizing um, construction and it's fantastic, I think. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and the more we can do that, the more we can improve the cost. Um, so then, so basically then you keep that staff on, um, on for project after project. Is that a perpetual thing? Is that how you, you plan that out or do you hire for the job under one roof? No, it's important to keep the same consistent staff because again, you don't see improvement gains in that first year doing a new trade or new people. It's not until you get a system, a rhythm, an infrastructure down. That requires having people that are willing to stick with you long term and are the right kind of people. You put a lot of time and attention into doing that right. Um, but yeah, once you build that up, then you can rinse and repeat. It's very important we provide a very consistent workflow to our team. So they're they know how they have a job consistently. They know after this project's done, they're moving right to the next one. Um, so we we do all of our own work for that very reason, because we can rent them out to our renters at a pretty stable rate. But if we were selling or building these buildings for other developers or other owners, that demand fluctuates so much. Uh, I mean, right now, I've seen the 90% drop in new multifamily starts because we have everything under, under one roof. We don't really get negatively impacted by that too much. Right, right. Um, so, huh. So then you, you, I mean, that's like built in maintenance department and everything. Like your crews, you can pull them to do work in your buildings that you already have up and save costs there too. You're, you're all, all in one shop. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty magical because if uh, something ha goes wrong in the building with the HVAC, we literally have the people on the team that engineered it, that that installed it, that figured out, did all the, the the commissioning of it, and they can come out and actually diagnose the problem and solve it. It's a lot more efficient in that way too, because they know it so well. I like it. I like it. Um, so, what size team were you talking? Like, I'm just curious. I I I mean, just being part of kind of similar. I've never been on a project that big, but similar project. Like, what's the size of the team? How much? How much workforce have you reduced? I have to assume it's it's you have a smaller. If you took all the subs and all their workers and tallied them compared to your workforce, you have to be way smaller. Just just my guess, the way it's running efficiently. Yeah, I don't have necessarily a staff by staff comparison. We do have about two hundred employees today, uh, and we're producing about um, four hundred units a year right now. And so that, uh, yeah, I, you're, I'm. You're putting these up. Yeah. You're so. What size building were you putting up in? You said nine months now. Is that is that the size you're targeting? Uh, well, we're, we're targeting a little larger than that. So our typical okay. building size now is like 350 units. Okay, and that's that's going up in in just you said 400 a year, so just under a year. Typically, yeah. That's. That's crazy fast, man, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool to see because the, the way we do work, we're so condensed and we're doing one unit at a time that literally one end of the building, there's no foundation. It's just dirt. And the other end of the building, it's fully completed apartment units like they're ready to move into. Um, it's, it's pretty cool to see. Every five hours, we have a brand new apartment unit complete right now. 
All right. <laughs> Give me a second. I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Yeah. That, that's insane. Um, okay. Okay. Is that, is that, um, did you do anything else, uh, building materials, anything like that? Or, or have you just worked on workflows? Cause you, you just, yeah, did, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, yeah. So, um, we have built our own engineering and architecture team on staff. In fact, the person who leads that our head engineer is honestly probably the best in the country at what he does. And I'm not exaggerating on that. We really fight to find the very best people in the world of what they do. And so, yeah, they work on new techniques all the time. Uh, we've got patents on certain um, uh, techniques and also uh, materials and things that we use. They, uh, they're, Our engineers are one of the first to do certain um, composite materials in the world. Uh, they're, they've, in fact, they've gone back to some of the governing bodies that kind of set the rules and regulations of what we do. And they've actually corrected their uh, their math. <laughs> That's how good this team is. And nice. so it's been fun I watching like them it. kind of inventing the future. I like it. You guys do anything with like um, styrocrete or alternative stuff like that in uh, in Minnesota, man. I, I, I don't envy your um, your HVAC team, your your um, your climate control people uh, live th living there and farming there. I uh, it's pretty brutal. Uh, you, you got do you you have to probably work that into the mix some sort of um some sort of weather stuff oh for sure <clears throat> uh because we are again we're producing a new unit every five hours and that's wind snow <laughs> oh, okay conditions. right that's yeah. all open in what um okay hold on one second somebody asked how many square foot uh unit you're talking uh they vary in size the smallest are maybe like four to 500 square feet. That's just a small studio. Our largest is like 2000 plus square feet. Those are penthouse, maybe two story suites. Uh, the average is probably around 900 square feet. So normal, I mean, apartment sizes in yeah. Minnesota haven't really dropped. <laughs> uh, they, they are getting a little smaller with time, but uh, not significantly. I mean, I, I grew up in, in Western New York, went to school in Buffalo, and I talked to a bunch of people. They grew up in New York City, um, and then I, I got apartments. And so hearing those horror stories, I've never thought anything was way too small. <laughs> and now I live in a travel trailer. So, Oh, wow. Well, that's fun. Yeah, we're, we're uh, traveling around the country, um, kind of checking stuff out, doing, doing work here and there, and uh, deciding where we want to end up. So. Oh, had to get out amazing. of the winter. The, the the winter drove us out of there. So anytime uh, anytime somebody's doing something to compensate for that, I I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Uh, we're not in Florida or California, unfortunately. So um, yeah, this is this is cool, man. I um, I like this. I um, I like that you just looked at it different. How did you? How did you? How did you find that model? Was that something that you had learned in another industry? Did you just sit and have a massive brainstorming session or how did that, how did you make that connection? Boy, it's a lot of things coming together. Again, we fight to hire some of the very best people in the world and we'll actually fly people in from other states to come here and work and fly them home on the weekend. One of our employees in 2007, Steve Jobs announces the iPhone Steve Jobs walks off stage and our employee walks on that same stage following that presentation with that same audience. Uh, and when you bring that caliber of people together, you just you discover and find new things that, that you wouldn't have thought of before. And it's a lot of trial and error too. We For every success that we have, there's probably another five <laughs> failures and attempts at trying things. I think the key is to not be afraid of that failure and just keep getting out there and trying new and different things until you figure out what works right yeah that that makes a lot of sense that you um you had the, a team like that too mm -hmm. that's excuse me i um we we kind of do something similar not to that caliber uh, but uh with content creators and and our groups and our communities and homesteading and any idea across the board gets discussed and 
if you if you run into something, you throw it out there. And the, the things that I see coming out of uh, a think tank type model like that just blow my mind sometimes. And this one, this one hasn't disappointed for sure. Um, so what's the uh, what's the plans going forward now? So you have this in motion. Uh, just just sticking to it, pounding out here in in, uh, in the Twin Cities. Or um, is there big plans to to go go for it and really really change the world? Because I think you're changing the world already um, in doing this. Especially if anybody that ever listens to you speak um, follows your model. Yeah. Well, and there's other amazing people I get to interact with regularly who are also making an impact, and so we get to share ideas as well. But our dream over the next decade is to reach 192,000 units under management with about a 60,000 unit per year pace. And see the magic at that sort of level, we're starting to now produce enough units to have a meaningful impact on housing supply. Now, why is that important? Let me take a step back for a moment. If you were to go on our website today and look at our prices of our apartments, they're about the same as everyone else in our market. And most people at this point say, Mike, dude, you just were talking about lowering the cost of construction, solving housing affordability. This makes no sense. Why aren't your apartments any cheaper? And the answer is quite simple. If we were to lower rents today, we would solve housing affordability for a few thousand people. That's fantastic, but that's not solving it for people nationwide. So instead, what we're doing is we're taking the profits that we're earning on these properties and putting it into the system that builds housing. Elon Musk talks about how it's hard to produce a car, but it is 10 to 100 to 1,000 times harder to produce the system that builds that car. And imagine their manufacturing plans. The same for us. We're building up manufacturing infrastructure to be able to build these apartments more at scale. And so we're pouring our energy and attention into that so that over the next decade, we're producing so many units to the marketplace that now we're starting to have an impact on supply and demand and prices start coming down. But here's the magic. It's not just for our own residents. It's for everyone in the community that are producing these units. And that's truly how you can solve housing affordability at a nationwide level. Right, because by you by you even staying stagnant with price, you you lower the price yeah Uh, like the graph i was talking about earlier that that was on a pretty steep incline still to this day um and i don't see it changing or going less steep um you staying stagnant is a significant um if you could just like okay we can forecast out for the next three years and say we can just not raise rent you know how how valuable that is just just for the security sake of somebody sitting in an apartment trying to figure out how they're going to pay for it if someone could could say that and with yeah. the, with your model and, and and lowering those costs that that seems not like very far off unrealistic something not maybe not three years but maybe maybe hey we we can give you two years of of, of it's not going to go up What's amazing is there's other countries. I mean, Tokyo is such a good example. I was reading an article today in the New York Times where Tokyo is the largest, it's the the cheapest large city to live in. And they've just done things differently. Foundationally, the difference is they've been able to produce so much housing to keep up with demand. In many places across the United States, just, just has not been the case. And so that's what we want to solve. How how far away are you from expanding? Are you only in only in the Twin Cities right now, or are you already currently working other places? Are you or is that targeted already? Yeah, we're just in Minnesota right now for our properties. Although we do have manufacturing capabilities in Wisconsin, and we're also looking now at expanding into Texas. Um, yeah, and so we will be expanding more nationwide. But we really want to make sure we get the system down right, and then we'll scale that up from there. Nice. Nice. So, um, yeah. Okay. What's so anything crazy that we missed in in your uh, in? I mean, I I'm so I'm so enamored with with the change in that system and just thinking through like it just flipped a switch in my head. Um, seeing the process you you described. 
being mm. part of it, being part of projects, being part of builds and decommissionings, um, seeing that, like picturing how that would work in so many different things. Uh, I was just like, okay. Um, so I kind of missed out on, um, are there other things that we missed in uh, that, that you're kind of striving towards? You know, one thing I can share that's maybe helpful to the audience is there's a couple of key lessons I've learned through all this. And, and one of them is to hire the very best. And when I say very best, I truly mean that. We talked about the kind of people we have here. But the response I often get is, Mike, that sounds expensive. And it's true. <laughs> As a cost per person, hiring the best is the most expensive that you can do. How does that work with reducing cost? See, the thing that most people fail to understand is that the best people outperform the average by two to five to 10 times as much. And I've seen that over and over again. And so instead, if you look at it from the perspective of the cost of compared to what they're producing, it's actually the least expensive. So that was one of the key learnings that I've had to really kind of change the game of what we're doing. And another one I think that's really important for everyone is that there's something that happens to us as we go older. See, as a kid, we don't really care that we're not super good at things, right? We can't walk, we can't talk, we can't ride a bike, but we learn how to do those things with time. But as we get older, we start to feel that if we get into something new, that we should be good at it out of the gate. Otherwise, that looks badly upon us. But that's really the wrong perspective. See, there was this interesting study done where there was two different teams. Each team was to make a clay pot or clay pots. The first team was told just to make the very best clay pot that they could. The second team was told to make as many clay pots as they could. Well, it turned out when all said and done, the first team made the best first pot, but the second team was making far, far better pots by the end of their work. The point being is that we can't, before we start, know how to deal with everything, know how to solve the problems. You just have to get in there, get dirty, fail a bunch, be okay in failure, and then work through that and pass that. It's through that journey is where you really become extraordinary at anything that you could do. Yeah, I've um I I learned that a long time ago. Mm. I, I'm like one of those serial job hoppers um, <laughs> because I get bored. It not and, and then I get frustrated and I want to go do something else. Uh, but having to start and I always change industries, like take take a pay cut, new industry, learn something, get frustrated, go new industry. Um, but starting from the bottom over and over and over on purpose, really, like I'm making the choice to do it. Uh, it really it really makes it OK to be not that good at shit. <laughs> That's awesome. I love get, that. Because you get better and then you move on. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's true. I mean, you started this podcast, but you know, we started our own podcast. We've got some of our own shows as well. But like getting yourself out there for the first time on that first oh, episode, man. at least for me, <laughs> it's terrifying, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you you learn that nobody watched the first episode, nobody cares, right? And you slowly get better with time and get more of that feedback in. That's the way oh, it's for done. Sure. For sure. Um, I was thinking a question here while you, while you were talking there uh, was your change accepted. Um, you were talking about bringing, bringing in the best. Um, that can be a hard sell. I mean, I know you were in charge, um, but there were, you weren't the only one. You, I mean, there were other people that had like input into the business. I have to assume. Um, was it a hard sell? I think pain and failure is a really good catalyst for change. <laughs> and so for us during that time, we were building a building and um, we were doing all right. But in honesty, like it was a bit of a disaster because the teams just weren't strong enough. What we were doing at the time is we were uh, hiring on temp laborers, which nothing against temp laborers, but it's not a great way typically to find your best employees because the best ones aren't even looking for jobs, right? And so we uh, we were just struggling, struggling, struggling. And there's like, there's got to be a better way. And during that time, we were, I, I read a book and our whole leadership team read a book um, 
by uh, Reed Hastings. It's called No Rules Rules. And that's where we started to really learn this principle. And it's kind of said, like, we've got nothing to lose. What we're doing today isn't working. Let's try something different. And so then we, we were a little crazy. We went and evaluated our entire team, everyone on our team, and we laid off most people and rebuilt. It was it was a little crazy. Um, I saw on your on your your question list, you you have unlimited PTO. Is that we do? Okay. Um, I've never been in a situation that's had it. I've 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 I kind of understand the concept because I've looked into it because it's it interests me. Um you want to talk about that a little bit and how that that kind of works and your philosophy behind that and if it's abused or not or um, how it's working for you? Yeah, so if you want the best people, you have to pay top of market and give top of market benefits. There's really no way around it. Otherwise, the best people are going to work somewhere else, right? Uh, and so one of those, when we looked at benefits, we looked at who's doing it best in the world, not just our own industry, not just our own neighbors. And so we went to look at Google and Netflix and Apple and all the big tech giants to learn what they were doing. And we basically copied all their benefits. And to my knowledge, no one at the time applied unlimited paid time off to hourly employees, especially construction workers. Right? Right. This is completely unheard of. <laughs> um, it is a little ter terrifying, but I think the magic is if you hire great people, they don't take advantage of it, right? Uh, you know, most companies, if you took a spectrum, most companies know that they don't want the bad ones. Most companies know they want the great ones. Where we're different than most companies is that we don't want the average. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with the average. You can have great workplaces elsewhere, but we really want the people that are there to change the world. And like our hiring process right now, I think the acceptance rate is like 0.4%. Give you some perspective. Harvard is 10 times that at 4%. And so when you have that caliber of people, it's not a problem. They right. take time off when it's reasonable and right to them. And like, there's a high degree of trust there because the employee is doing all they can to support the company. The company does all they can to support the employee. And that's where the magic happens. If you either go right. back down the rabbit hole negatively and it doesn't work. It really needs to work from both directions for sure exactly. to, to work. Um, and that I think that model uh, played out a lot in my frustrations over the years as an employee that wanted to always improve a business and always felt resistance when bringing ideas and mm. and bringing like very, very reasonable ideas. Um, and I did my due diligence and, you know, cost savings and and just presented things and and was never really I don't I didn't want acknowledgement for it i just wanted something to change um i didn't even need credit for the damn idea i just wanted my life to get easier um and they wouldn't do things and i think that that was um probably uh because of the choice of places i worked um that's obviously but i love, uh, I love that you brought that up that's one of my biggest pet peeves in fact i do all of our orientations and i was did, did orientation again today and at orientation one of the things i tell everyone in that room is that make the change you want to see you don't need permission in this company i'd rather you take action and change something and mess it up and we have to go back than for you to never take action at all i think most companies are afraid of their employees doing the wrong thing but i'm much more afraid that your situation is going to happen where you don't feel empowered to do the right thing so then i tell everyone if someone questions you on what you're doing, just tell them that Mike told you to do it, right? <laughs> so you want to change that mindset of your team. For sure. That's, um, that's great. And I, I can see why I can see why you're so efficient. I can see why your crews work well together. I mean, it, it's in just hearing you speak um, and, and hearing your production capabilities, it, it's not, you're not bullshitting. Like you're mm -hmm. not throwing out, um, it, it all makes sense. It all adds up. So I applaud that for sure. It's, it's crystal clear that you're, you're walking the walk and talking the talk too. So, um, I, uh, somebody has asked if you're considering modular, let me see, I'll put it up here. Uh, are you considering modular, uh, infrastructure, i.e. heating and cooling, hot and cold water? 
I'm not sure what he's meaning by that. Maybe you do. He's uh, he's kind of in construction and design. So, if you don't understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there's a few different modular things that come to mind. And certainly you can uh, elaborate on the question if, if the uh, viewers are willing to do that. But one thing in the world of modular that is pretty common right now is called a full volumetric construction where they produce an entire apartment unit and you deliver it on site like Lego blocks and kind of set it all on site. We are moving that direction. We're still trying to figure out if that lowers costs or not. Okay. Uh, then there's another modular sense of like maybe building an entire bathroom pod and then dropping those bathroom pods in place or even as simple as like standardizing your wall. So for us now, I think we're down to like 20 different wall lengths and types. There's 20 unique walls in the entire building that they just kind of swap in and out and put in place when they need to. Uh, and the same thing with fixtures and with plumbing. You can uh, modulize that and kind of standardize it so that you're using these components, this kit of parts, rather than an infinite universe of possibilities. And it helps improve efficiency. That's Yeah, that 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 makes sense for sure. Are you guys doing anything with um, printing? 3D, 3D printing? printing? Con concrete printing or anything of that nature? It's super interesting tech. In fact, those are the sorts of techs that get all the headlines, and I love that. Now, but the reality, at least in 3D printing right now, the, the stuff that we've looked into, it doesn't help reduce cost yet. Right. But I think yeah. <laughs> these technologies, as they mature, they will. Uh, some of the technologies we're looking at very, very carefully is like the Tesla bot or Boston Dynamics and their robotics. It's incredible what they're doing. And so it's it's not quite there yet. But as that improves, we'll be using more of that robotics in our in our work. You think you'll be able to re re replace um, standardized jobs? Um, and you'll go to more of a, a technician based technician based workforce with robotic installation uh over time yeah robots will do more <laughs> and more of the work i don't know if i'll ever get well so i don't think in my lifetime it'll ever get to the point that it fully takes over even okay. uh tesla the original design for their plant was to do like fully automatic everything and uh, they actually elon talks about it they had to back away from that because the thing that a human is so good at is that we're so uh, so flexible and able to handle a variety of situations that just humans are so far superior in certain circumstances that it just doesn't make sense for robotics. But even with robotics, for example, there's self-driving like uh, excavation equipment that we've been looking at where, yes, you need less people running the equipment because you can run a fleet of them, but you still need someone with an iPad making sure that the whole system is running correctly. So it right. changes the style of work. I can imagine a day that a construction worker will roll out of bed, crawl their way over to their desk, sit down at the computer, and actually control robotics from a computer from the safety of their home rather than having to be on site. Right. Yeah. And well, and the, the, interesting thing is so i was in kind of the the blue collar maintenance for quite a while i did um i actually worked did you ever uh, come across so uh, i would have been a while ago how long have you been have been up and going in this phase of your your building right now in, uh, in this phase of the company kind of that transitional phase i've been well i've been a c i've been ceo for about 10 years now 10 years okay i would have been long before that um i i'm dating myself in minnesota oh, no. Right now. now i worked for a, a, a couple startups and things of that nature but did the like i saw the writing on the wall as i was doing maintenance work um and things were getting automated and things were getting installed into machines for remote diagnostics to where your your fleet of technicians now is one guy coming out to possibly further troubleshoot or have a very good idea of what actually is going on before he even steps foot on there. Um, and I really transitioned into learning that side of it, the technician side of it on the higher end, the level two, level three technicians, because I, I, I really saw the, the disappearance of the, the um, turn and wrenches guy. They're just going to have it replaced. Mm. It's so true. Yeah, there, there's so many interesting technologies that just help 
as you mentioned, diagnose and kind of monitor those potential problems. It just makes sense. I think over time, we'll see more and more of that to make our systems and infrastructure stronger. Yeah, yeah. Hey, man, it, we're coming up on an hour. I usually, I usually give the guest um, kind of free reign if they if they want. I mean, you you gave a couple great points there a little bit back, but if you have uh, have something you want to leave people with, uh, definitely tell them where they can find you and um, where to find more information, how they can help you or or uh, learn about your project. And man, the floor is yours as long as you want it, and and then we can wrap up. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, for us, you can learn more by visiting norhart.com. That's N-O-R-H-A-R-T.com. We have really kind of two really interesting new things that we're working on. One um, is a new podcast called Zero to Unicorn. It's about the journey of small business growing to that billion-dollar scale. And season one was on our history and our journey. But now season two, we're actually turning into the journey of others. And the caliber of guests we have coming on are incredible. Uh, uh, the episode one of season two is by Michael Uslan. He is the originator and executive producer of the Batman movies. In fact, he's also done National Treasure, Lego movies, uh, Joker. In fact, as I was coordinating with him, he was on set with the, uh, the Joker movies. Yes. And what's really interesting about his story is that people think, that achieving success means you put a lot of hard work in for maybe six months, a year, or two years. But that's not the case. In Michael's situation, he spent 10 years from the time he was able to purchase the movie rights to Batman to the point that he could finally get the movie made. 10 years of people saying, no, this isn't going to work. His story is incredible, as well as we got uh, a number of billionaires on the on the show will be coming up as well. Very amazing right. people. And then uh, the second thing we have going on that's pretty interesting is that we've launched our first opportunity to invest. It's called Norhart Invest, and we're offering high rates of interest to money that's invested between six and 24 months. We do a lot to protect those assets. In particular, we lose our money before you, the investor, could lose yours. And so uh, that's been really exciting as a way of kind of allowing people to invest directly in what we do. Most real estate investment, I don't know if you know this, but most real estate investment, average people can't get into. And the reason that is is because the SEC puts rules in place that say only accredited investors can get in. We went the harder route. It took us a year to get approval. Uh, we had to do quite a bit of work with the SEC to get all the approvals. But now anyone in the United States can invest in what we're doing. And so if you're interested in our mission to solve housing affordability, as well as earning a really great interest rate, it's a, it's a great opportunity. And you can learn more about that by, again, visiting our website, norhart.com. That's N-O-R-H-A-R-T.com. Nice. Nice. That's I, I am going to check out the podcast for sure. I'm, I'd love to hear the the whole season of, of your story and your, your information's in the show notes and I will, uh, I'll have it in blog post and I'll, I'll blast it around too on socials, but man, I, uh, I appreciate you coming on and, and having this chat. That's, this is, um, this has opened up a lot of, synapses in my brain i guess tonight <laughs> this, this is Love um, it. yeah i i appreciate you appreciate you going over over that with us and man i i i congratulate you on the mission and and um and achieving uh at least getting started i don't i don't think you're even close to done but um you've changed things and if anybody if anybody has has adapted even a fraction towards what you're doing i think it's an improvement so Bravo, man. I, I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been a ton of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep an eye on things. And uh, and if we have any big developments or anything, we'll, we'll be sure to have you back. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna drop you off. If you could hang out for a second, I'd like to chat after. But I'm going to close things up and, uh, and we'll wrap it up and uh, get out of here. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Mike. All right. I want to thank Mike for coming on. Uh, man, that... Uh, that's that's crazy uh, change in in the status quo, um, man. When I when I set up the the 
the stream and and made the description and everything i didn't think that uh that i was being being over exaggerating when i said uh, blazing a new path and man he blew blew my mind for sure um i appreciate him coming on be sure to check out the link in the audio description the video description and uh and check in check out more uh this has been another episode of lots to talk about be sure to leave a review share it with somebody that you think would like hearing it and uh, we will catch you next time